Um, hands up, students. Hands up, staff. Welcome, especially staff. What do you study? Journalism? Uh, communications? Social science? What have I missed? What subjects have I missed? <laughs> ah. Philology. You will have fun with me with Irish accent. <laughs> you will never hear an accent like this again. This is supposed to last for the rest of your lives, really. An hour and a half. Um, it's, I would like to have conversation, so please interrupt, ask questions, okay? We will work out, someone will translate for me. You will, Nikolai will translate for me. He did it all day yesterday, he will do it today, okay? So please ask questions, and if you don't quite get, follow. What am I hearing? Um, if you don't follow anything I'm saying, please ask, okay? Try to have a conversation because it's about the history of media, which is about communication. And one old man sitting preaching like priest is not good talk, okay? So this is the story of the BBC, one of the first broadcasters in the world and still one of Britain's best known brands. I'm not telling the story because it's all that important in itself, but it's where I spent 30 years of my life, and it's symbolic of the tension between the media and government, okay? So it's the relationship between government and the media, and how that changes over time. Does that make sense as a topic? Now, that's still going on in every country in the world. Still that love hit between media and government. Sometimes more hit than love. In America, with President Trump, very much hit, not much love. Fake news! Am I speaking too quickly or too slowly? Okay. You follow? You can hear, okay, you, you got it. Good luck to the interpreter with me. Um, I would, it would be, to go back to the beginning of this story and then to unfold. I, my basic theory is that every organization has the DNA of the decade in which it was founded. This university still has something, especially in this building, of 1888 in it. It feels right for the time. I think the media still have a bit of a century ago inside them. And I'm trying to explore that. I'll talk about it in wide terms, but then specifically how it dealt with, if we have time at the end, how it dealt with the place I come from, Northern Ireland, where there, were, there was civil war and conflict, okay? Firstly, the media come from the inventiveness, not of journalists, not of great producers and directors, but the evolution of the media comes from engineers and technologists. They create the media. They give us toys to play with. It's not philologists, journalists, historians, social scientists who create the World Wide Web. It's not us who create radio, television, online, 
it's great engineers and great technologists. They move on and then we move in and put content into their device. Does that make sense? But sometimes we forget that the original creativity came fr comes from great engineers, great technologists, and much later, editorial figures, people like us, move in and populate those media, but also so do political figures, slowly realize that the media have, are a very effective way of getting into the hearts and the minds of the public and manipulating and using the media to inspire, to engage, and sometimes to motivate the public for good reasons and bad. Make sense? But that comes after the technology. The guy who created radio was an engineer, Marconi. He created radio in its fo the form that it exists in Britain today and far beyond Britain. And his, what he set out to do was not to create radio at all. Does anyone know what he was actually trying to do? And who commissioned him? Yeah. Just before the war, before the war, ships had a bad habit of sinking when crossing the Pacific and crossing the Atlantic. And the insurance companies, mainly Lloyd's of London, were worried about not getting the Titanic, the, s the terror of the Titanic. How could you get signals quickly from ship to shore? He was commissioned to do that, and radio was an unintended byproduct. All they could get was bleep, 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 you know, Morse code messages. That's what he set out, and suddenly he realized it carried more than bleep, 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 it could carry the human voice. And many of the great inventions in the world are like that. They are not intended inventions, they are unintended byproducts. And that's a, ver a very interesting study. And please do look on the web for unintended advances in science. Very often, it's not what people set out to do, it's a byproduct, okay? Um, and Mar Marconi began work 1896, those signals, just at the same time our two universities were in kindergarten, we're just beginning. So widespread popular education in Tomsk or in southeast London was happening at the same time as widespread media was created. This idea that everyone could be involved in university life if they were smart enough, clever enough, and everyone could communicate right around the world by this technology. It was a period of great hope and great excitement. Just after the war was the mo when they were trying to get commerce back together again. But of course, early days were very confused. The Navy and the Army complained bitterly because their signals were being affected. They couldn't communicate with each other. And what they were getting was the sound of a woman singing on the airwaves rather than their messages going from ship to ship. But in the United States, the fast growth of radio was remarkable. In, in 1922, there were 219 radio stations in the United States by 24, Two years later, twice that number, 540 by 24. So rapid, rapid growth in the number of stations. And even in Britain, they had to realize that you couldn't simply ban radio. They tried to ban it, they tried to control it, not possible. So what they decided to do was to try to create one organization that could represent radio, represent the content production. 
And that was easy because everyone thought there was no money in content. No money in what went on the airwaves. What did they think the money was in? How did they think they would make money from radio? The big, at the early days in Russia, early days in America, early days in Britain, selling radios. They, they were very expensive then. No one seemed to care about what was on the radio. In fact, there's a ballroom in the middle of London, the Savoy Ballroom. What they used to do was take a microphone and hang the microphone in the middle of the ballroom, record the dance band, and broadcast that around the country. They didn't care what was on it as long as the signal could get to Newcastle or Manchester. That was exciting for an engineer. No one thought of making new content. They were just having fun sending signal. And they thought the money was in the set, in the radio, not in content. No one had thought of advertising, commercials. No one had yet thought of packaging content and selling it. Does this sound like the early days of the World Wide Web? Exactly the same. No one had realized yet where the money was. And Marconi was a bit like Google or Apple today. He had the technology. He, and so the government had to work with this man to decide what kind of radios, what electrical system they would back. They brought 200 companies together and they decided that this British Broadcasting Company would be created. It was a company first. And that the money would be provided by everyone who bought a radio paying a license. And that license fee is still exists in Britain today. The BBC license fee. That you would pay for the privilege of owning a radio. And in many parts of the world, that's still the case, a license fee. Now, is there a license fee in Russia for owning a television or a radio? Do you, do you pay for, do you pay government for owning a set? No. No, it's free. See, you're in the free world. We're in the unfree world. We have to pay. If you live, if you own a television set in Britain now, you pay a license fee, 170 pounds, to government. And that content is used to fund the BBC. That money is used to make programs for the BBC. And that all began in 1922. That company decided that they needed a boss, a single boss, and that's the man, John Reith, the son of a Scottish clergyman, a priest. And he created the BBC. He was very fond of this photograph. He liked it because, see the wound on his cheek? That's a bullet from the First World War. And he was very proud. I'm a brave soldier. But he liked to show this wound. Every portrait had to have the wound in it to prove how brave he was. So he, he, under royal charter then, created what we now know as the BBC. And very early on, you probably have never heard of the general strike in Britain. The Russian Revolution happened in what year? Did the Russian Revolution happen? <laughs> the, the one that created the Bolshevik government, Lenin's revolution. 17. 17. So the BBC came only five years after the Bolshevik revolution. And Britain lived in fear because where did Marx and Engels really live and do most of their writing? London. They were the British establishment were very, very scared that there would be a popular revolution in Britain, just like in Russia. And the royal family saw what happened to their cousins 
the Tsar and his family, and they were very, very worried. And in, after the First World War, by 1926, people were fed up being hungry, fed up with terrible housing, with unfair society, no opportunities, and there was a withdrawal of labor, a strike. And everyone thought that this was the beginning of a communist revolution in Britain. Big, big challenge for the young BBC because everyone was very tense. And Reith said to Parliament that the BBC should not be seen to be a creature of government or connected with political activity. He said, we have got to stand apart and not side with people on the streets or with government. Anything else, he said, would lack status and dignity. So a separate group was created of governors that would run the BBC. Not government, not directly. It was to be run by a group of people. But that group of people, conveniently, were appointed by government. But they were not government. They were separate. And that's how this separation of the media and government was created in the Western world. And the governors tried to keep the BBC as much in the middle of the political debate, not taking sides as they possibly could. Not easily done. And Reith said the job of the media was simple, even in a tense political situation like that, that the media existed to inform, to educate, and to, what were the three things that the media were for? Inform, educate, and entertain. entertain. Very good. To inform, to educate, and entertain. People say it's the first mission statement for any organization. Every organization's got a mission statement now. To inform, to educate, to entertain. Does that make sense? And every one of us who ever worked for the BBC felt we had to explain our job doing either one of those things, or maybe all of them. Inform, educate, entertain. Inform, provide information that people, whether they were for government or against government, would trust. Trust is the key thing. If people don't trust the media, big problem. Dangerous. Inform. Educate. There was very poor literacy in Britain at that time. Families like the family I came from had never been to a theater, had never been to a classical music concert, had never been near, had never on, had any contact with the university. But the airwaves allowed them access to Shakespeare, to Chekhov, to Dostoevsky, to the great writers of a generation. If you have a radio, you could listen to the best drama, best music in the world. It was very revolutionary in forms of education. You had access to the best brains in the country, the best brains in Europe, debating and arguing. It was like a university on air. And people were excited and empowered by radio in their homes. And very poor people from very poor backgrounds had access to content that no one in their community had ever had access to before. Because theaters were too middle class and too expensive for most people to go to. But through the mission to educate, they had access. And then none of that is any good if the content isn't entertaining, funny, exciting as well. And they had to bring in skills that made. So engineers created and then inform, educate, and entertain. You bring in people like you to make content that is trustworthy, is educational, and is entertaining. And that 
Those were the founding principles. And in, um, across America, public service broadcasting, most of the countries in Europe have some form of public service broadcasting. And that really means radio that isn't made, in those days, radio for profit. It's made for public good, and it's funded by everyone paying a relatively small tax each year called the license fee. Does that make sense so far? And that was the beginning of the notions of publicly owned content and a public purpose for the media. In the middle of the general strike, however, the Home Secretary was Winston Churchill, a name you've heard before, Winston Churchill, who became Prime Minister during the Second World War. He thought the BBC was very dangerous and he wanted to control the BBC. He thought that they should only speak what government wanted them to say, never criticize government, and be entirely on the side of government. Many, many disputes between Churchill and Reith. And this isn't, in truth, the BBC did not behave always honorably. The leader of the Labour Party was basically banned from the BBC. They didn't get on air at all. And anyone who spoke publicly in favour of the striking workers were seldom allowed on air. So he didn't let Churchill rule the BBC, but he did a lot of things that Churchill wanted him to do. Early BBC was bullied by government to support government or at least, if not supported, not to publicly criticize it. The BBC tends to want to forget that period, but I think it's important to remember that there were compromises and dangerous moments when government tried to control what was said. How many countries in the world can you think of that same thing happening today? practically every country that you can imagine. And yet, the BBC, despite government, had statements from the leaders of the strike. And Reith said to Churchill, I told him that if we put out nothing but government propaganda, we should be doing half the good that we are. If we put out nothing but government propaganda, we would be doing half the good that we are. Propaganda is, not, is dangerous in society, is the thesis, because the public don't believe it. They don't trust government because they believe they're being told lies. And Reith tried to persuade Churchill that that was the case. And he said, the BBC media must give both sides of every debate and try not to alarm politicians unduly. So don't make politicians angry, but equally give both sides of a debate. The Great British Revolution never happened. Government made some concessions to the workers and society kind of resumed as it was with the royal family still in place. Russia went an entirely different way. But the establishment was maintained in Britain. And arguably, the media played some part in, in that. However, it, historians say, one of Britain's leading historians, that the, the Britain portrayed by the early BBC was not the real Britain. According to the BBC, everyone was devout, religious, and middle of the road, middle class. They portrayed a comfortable, middle class, religious Britain that really wasn't entirely true. They created a cozy image 
of British life. The way American soap operas portray today a very cozy image of modern America. Mom and dad and the kids. Sweet candy floss McDonald's America. Well, the BBC portrayed in those days a very particular middle class comfortable view of Britain. And the working classes were encouraged to aspire to become members of the working class, of the middle class. Not to overthrow it, not to be in a revolution, but to join it. Taught social aspiration rather than social revolution. And that was quite a, con and that, the educate mission of the BBC fed into that narrative of be don't overthrow the system, become part of the system. And the media was a very subtle device for that. And remember that back to 1922, there was only one radio service in Britain, a monopoly, a complete monopoly, the BBC. As long as the commercial interests sold their radio sets, they didn't mind. And all of the content was ruled by the BBC. They took for granted that all of Britain was Christian and the staff had to comply with very strict standards. Divorce was not allowed inside the BBC staff. If you were divorced, you had to leave the BBC. Atheists and agnostics were never allowed on air to challenge religion, for example, never. So while the BBC talked constantly about freedom of speech, it wasn't all that free. It was freedom of speech within set boundaries. And to some extent, most media outlets are like that today. There is freedom, but freedom within a particular mindset, particular boundaries. But what happened maybe more subtly and unplanned, has anyone, <laughs> That's the first commentary box at Wimbledon. Wimbledon, where Maria Sharapova dominates, where what the media ended up doing in Britain, what the BBC did, it took a suburban tennis tournament. I looked to my friend Garant, who knows a lot about tennis, but that was a tiny, marginal, insignificant tournament, but because First radio and then television covered it every day of every tournament. They turned a small event into a very big event. The media confers grandeur, confers significance by being there. And by making thousands of people who would never have dreamt of going to Wimbledon, making them aware of it and excited about it. So the media create events, and events like Wimbledon or the university, the university boat race, who cares who wins a boat race between Oxford and Cambridge University? But if it's covered on radio and then on television, suddenly people care. Horse races like the Grand National, just an ordinary horse race, but because it's on radio and television, suddenly they become really important events. And over years, everyone that plays at Wimbledon makes hundreds of thousands of pounds. They become big international events by the magic of media coverage. And that's what happened with Wimbledon, Boat Race, Grand National, the Derby. And those events, after a while, become part of what it means to be British. They become part of a shared notion of nationhood, including 
royal events, royal funerals, royal weddings, the media turns a small thing into a very big thing that people care about. Possibly the biggest shared event I remember in my time in the BBC was Diana's funeral. That turned into an international media festival. People weeping, floods of tears in the streets. It was like a medieval court. By the magic of the media, little things, possibly not that significant things, become very big. And when you ask anyone today, what does it mean to be English? Strawberries and cream at Wimbledon attending the boat race, being part of the Grand National, watching the tripping of the color at Westminster, all recognized because the media, radio and television make them significant. So suddenly, rather than reflecting nationhood, the BBC began to create a sense of nationhood. to give all of us a clearer sense of what it means to be British or what they would like us to think means to be British. A very middle class, polite, deferential, religious Britain. And the one thing I'd ask any of you as scholars of the media, be critical thinkers Think not just what the message is, but why the message is. What's being said within the message? What does that mean, ultimately mean, for society? And who benefits from that message? Any questions, please? Too boring for questions. <laughs> well, In what extent uh, Britannic humor could help uh, in relationship between BBC and uh, near the BBC e and BBC and government? Oh, very good. Yes, that's such a good question. There's a good PhD in the question you've just asked. And people have written about that, but not as deeply. The entertain part of the mission, inform, educate, entertain, is where humor sits. But humor probably is as important as any of the rest in making people feel good about themselves, and humor can ask questions that journalists don't ask, and can observe things that journalists find it hard to ask. In Britain, Private Eye magazine, or Spitting Image on television, those of you, you can still see it, can be very, very, very harsh on politicians making fun of the royal family, making fun of the Archbishop of Canterbury, teasing government ministers. But arguably, that is a very healthy thing because people feel that humor speaks for them and to them. 
and by not being ever so respectful, then it makes people feel that the country is freer to be critical. That did not happen in the BBC until the 1960s. That period of the BBC, the humor was awful. But by the night, I'll talk a little about the, this was totally humorless, solemn, good morning, BBC calling, London. This was very old school. But later on, humor, we'll talk, can I come back to humor later? Because it is very important as a way of communicating democracy, of making people feel free to say outrageous things and not be locked up for it. Um, <laughs> it's a good thesis. It, it'll be a good one to write. Um, let's just go on a bit from there. Now, when the establishment gets in trouble, does anyone know what's happen happened here? Yes. Uh, no, this is his brother. The, st the film is about his brother. Yes. This, this is, yeah, this King's Speech is the film. But this is um, Edward VIII, who became king in 1936, but wanted to marry a divorcee. Not only a divorcee, but an American divorcee. And that was not acceptable. So he abdicated the throne and said that he did not want to be king of England. Another big crisis, another big moment. But where did he go? How did he communicate with his people? How did he tell the public that he did not want to remain king? Let you guess. What's he doing there? Radio broadcast. So the BBC has only existed for about 10 years. But when the king wants to leave office, he goes to a radio station and tells the public. And what he said was, I cannot rule Britain without the woman that I love by my side. And he spent the rest of his life living in France. Which is just as well because it's widely believed he had very pro-Hitler sympathies in the war. <laughs> but uh, that Edward VIII, that was another moment of crisis. Now, someone said of the BBC at that time, however, it was flabby, uninspired, and had no relationship whatsoever to the, need, the real needs of listeners. A monopoly is a dangerous thing, very, very dangerous thing, and, me, and television, was beginning to grow with this period. Can I say one, just go off my history for a moment. Every time a new medium arrives, it is widely believed that the old media will die. When radio came, newspapers thought they were finished. They really thought that radio would kill newspapers. And the BBC wasn't allowed to carry news for the first six years. When television came, widely assumed that it would kill cinema. There would be no more movies. Why would you go to the cinema if there were pictures in your home? And it was widely believed that radio would die too. Every revolution and the World Wide Web, it was kind of widely assumed that that would kill television in your age. They find a way of existing together, the different media, but they, the old medium loses priority. It's not the main one anymore, but it's still there. Just watch out for that. Now, back to history. Why is, why is that relevant? While the BBC was being very, very pious and stuffy, art, design, passion, slogans, politics were combining together in this country to change the world. This was a revolution in so many ways, but it was a revolution of art 
design propaganda as well. A long, long way from the stuffy old BBC. Art and creativity, strong, clear messaging, were at the heart of the Bolshevik cause. And who learnt a lot from the Bolsheviks? Does anyone know who this is? The Third Reich, Nazi Germany learnt a great deal from the Bolsheviks. Not about politics, but about how to move and energize and excite the public. And the genius, I think, far greater genius than Goebbels behind this was Lenny Riefenstahl, who had been a famous actress and who became a movie maker. Have you seen Triumph of the Will? Have a look at Triumph of the Will if you haven't, because it's her creation of the Aryan master race around the 1936 Olympics, Munich, and how the Nuremberg rally. They took music, art, athletics, design, architecture, and created an integrated story of political hegemony. Like, and stealing a lot of ideas from Russia, by the way, in so doing. But they were way ahead of any other part of the world in propaganda and propagandizing a political message. And she lived until about 15 years ago. She went on to become a very famous nature photographer. She had so many different lives, Lenny Riefenstahl. But here's the Nuremberg rally. Is there content in one of these? Is there content there? There isn't any moving image there, is there, on that one? I thought maybe there was, maybe not. Yeah. Can you get this sound? Even without the sound, you can. Uh, sorry. Then please search for Triumph of the Will. And I'm sorry about this being mute, but music, images, so look, camera angle always pointed up. He looks like a Greek god. Every young person in the image is blonde haired and blue eyed, Aryan master race. The crowds, the salutes. This is choreographed theatrical politics. And this moved a nation to support a form of politics that was not entirely good. <coughs> but if we think of how quickly that had evolved from the bot battleship Potomkin through to triumph of the will. The media had grown so incredibly powerful, so much part of political life, and so very emotionally persuasive. Even today, watching that, you can feel the emotion. You can feel, even knowing the horrors that happened after that, you can see why Germans, humiliated in the First World War, 
found hope in this new leadership. And that was using, I would argue, the combination of Goebbels' political message and Lenny Riefenstahl's art. And how that can be used to change society for good and for bad. Okay. We'll go to the next one if I can. If I can. <laughs> so, we're coming to World War Two. Just pause, pause on that. So you have Goebbels. And <laughs> there are many movies made about Churchill. <laughs> anyway, play it. This, he just sat and smoked a cigar in a studio and talked practically every night to the nation on radio. When the German Blitzkrieg was happening, London was being bombed to bits. This elderly, depressive, emotionally unstable man found a way through radio of speaking to the nation. Now you can play. No, he won't speak. Yes, yes, yes. It's very interesting. He, none of the art, no posters, well, some posters, but not, no movie, no music, the human voice. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the land, we shall fight this island nation, shall not be defeated. And people wept listening to that. We shall not be defeated. Even though they were being defeated on practically every front. The bulldog spirit, they call it. The island nation will not surrender. We will never surrender. And that elderly man with every kind of problem, kind of kept the people believing in hope and believing in themselves and overcoming impossible odds. In truth, Hitler was completely distracted by fighting with Russia on the Eastern Front and <laughs> took pressure off and then America entered the war. But the heroic myth of the island people never being defeated was created and plays a part for me in why Britain has just chosen to leave the EU. They want to be an island people again, to make our own decisions, to not be subject to any rules coming from Europe. And the power of the human voice, beautifully written, well delivered, can match high-tech imagery if it's well-delivered. Never underestimate the quality of well-delivered human speech amidst all the noise and packaging of contemporary media. Yes, 
Exactly. Precisely. No distraction. No distraction. Just him. And he, he spoke. It sounded like he was sitting in his front room and you were sitting in your kitchen. And the family listened together. No noise. No distraction. Yeah. And Churchill was, this is me, I'm a history man and a journalist, so I don't tell you the truth, I tell you my version of the truth. Churchill was not a great peacetime leader. He was a very poor peacetime leader. And when, in 1945 election, the British public voted totally against Churchill. He wasn't allowed to come back. He cometh the man, cometh the hour, they say. He was the right person for the crisis that existed then. I don't think his personality, his slightly obsessive style would have suited peacetime at all. But something, no one could have predicted it. You could have had a thousand focus groups and not come up with Churchill. It, by pure circumstance, he met the demand of a moment and he raised, he was a much better public figure in the white heat of war than he was in the 1930s. So, so the, me, the media invented Churchill, Churchill invented the media message, but the media radio helped invent his ideas as well. It was a two-way street. Um, if that makes sense. Any, please, questions about anything? I got a lot of questions. Have anyone uh, gone to prison because of their speech on the radio or some propaganda? Yes, yes. Uh, journalists have gone to prison for breaking courtroom rules, legal rules, mm -hmm. and there was a very big conflict between the BBC and Churchill during World War II. Why do, can you guess why government hated? Like Churchill called the BBC the enemy within for part of World War II. What news do you think he did not want to hear? Yes, exactly. The number of Allied dead. If the BBC broadcast death toll from Dunkirk, from any one of the war zones, Rommel in the desert, there was... And yes, Prison was threatened. Libel, there are a number of laws that constrain freedom of speech. Mm. So how much uh, this is the space nowadays? The space is there, but it has to be used carefully, just like the freedom of the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web is the most democratic democratic, most free speech media environment I have ever known. I talked with colleagues from journalism here yesterday. When I was your age, there were only two outlets. You had to get on either television or radio, commercial television or the BBC. Those were very few doors to get through, to get any content published. Today, there are a thousand doors, there are a million doors. 
How many channels on YouTube? How many Facebook? How many WeChat? How many outlets? But it doesn't mean there is complete freedom. Increasingly, the law, politics, anxieties about pornography and gambling, anxieties about fake news are closing in on the World Wide Web and making it less free for all. So, like all other media, it's gradually being controlled for good and for bad. How do you trust messages on the web anymore? Because commercial companies are now creating their own channels that look like, let's take women's makeup. Lots of young women in Britain created channels giving advice and makeup. People were subscribing to those channels, thousands and thousands of young women. Those channels, many of them have been bought by L'Oreal, by the big cosmetic companies. And what looks like an independent personal message isn't independent at all. They only recommend commercial products. There is a lot of deceit and untruth in what looks like independent voice on the web anymore. But I still think it's a wonderful, exciting new frontier. But like every other frontier, don't believe all you read, don't believe all you see. Questions? about the journalist that was punished by government during uh, World War uh, II. So uh, isn't it a job, uh, journalism, to give, uh, uh, to tell truth to the people? Yes, <laughs> it is. I'll go on a bit to talk about my experience, but there is a line about journalism that I always use. Journalism should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Say it again, that, that journalism should comfort the afflicted, comfort people afflicted with trouble, mm -hmm. and afflict, give discomfort to afflict the comfortable. So, mm -hmm. journalism should always be on the side of the small person, the underdog. We bring, as a journalist, you have privileged access to President Putin. You can ask the president questions. The average person in the street can't ask those questions. You can ask those questions. You need to have great courage, not trying to be his best friend, asking questions he doesn't want to be asked. And that's true of big corporation owners, the rector of the university, Anyone with power and authority, journalists should speak for them and they should not speak for the powerful. Afflict the comfortable. People who are comfortable should be made to answer for their behavior and the behavior of their organization. And journalists need to be hugely courageous to do that. And it often costs you freedom and oft, sometimes it costs your life in some war zones. Because governments don't really like journalists being in a war zone with cameras recording what's happening in that country's name. Churchill, for sure, did not want there to be cameras in Dresden for the obliteration of Dresden, which you could argue was not necessary at all. 
in the world. But any news organization needs to have courage and be brave to know what it stands for. First point. Second point, news organizations have a duty to their staff not to allow them to take risks that are dangerous for the organization or their freedom. And news organizations on the whole should try to work within the law, assuming that the law is fair. It's a, it's a dangerous thing for a news or someone like me who was a news editor to send you, a young journalist, out to break the law. Because you will end up in prison, not me. And that doesn't feel like responsible behavior. Be careful of a news editor who sends you out to do dangerous things, to take risks for your life. Suggest to that editor they should go and do it themselves first. I'll do a little bit about when things became where I come from. That's Broadcasting House in Belfast in 1974. I worked in that building for 20 years. The IRA bombed the building. They wanted to take it off air because they believed the British Broadcasting Corporation could never be fair or honest that a British media company would never tell the truth about what was happening in Ireland. And working in there was a very challenging <laughs> life. And most of us were on death lists of one kind or another for being journalists there. I come from the Catholic Irish community. So I was not only working for the BBC, but I was also a traitor, in their view, to my background. That's not a comfortable place to be. And there were many, many threats. And for any media organization to cover a civil war inside their own country is really difficult. Because you have two completely different centers, senses of identity and of culture and language within the same country. And that's why a lot is written about this little conflict. It's a tiny, small conflict. Belfast is about the same size as Trump's, half a million people. But war was happening inside Belfast. And it was my job to be head of the BBC there for some of that time. And it was, real, on your question, incredibly frightening. And we did have journalists put in prison, and we did have attempts on all of our lives. And as you can see, they tried to actually bomb the building. Um, and it did force the BBC to constantly think about what they would do. And a classic scene. That's a cameraman, a sound recordist, and a terrorist standing side by side. I know those two men on the left. Mrs. Thatcher, you've heard of Margaret Thatcher? She believed that the BBC was the oxygen of terrorism that terrorists were using the BBC to advance their cause. What does terrorism really mean? What the fear of people? Create terror. Who creates terror best? I'm reporting from the scene of a bomb. There are 43 people killed. Bodies are being removed. Ambulances are approaching. <laughs> and Mrs. Thatcher basically banned the political wing of the organization on the right, IRA, would not let them on air. No interviews with anyone from Sinn Féin. Her legislation, the rules weren't very good. You could interview them, but you couldn't broadcast their sound. 
So what we did was we interviewed them and then we had actors read, their vo read what they said. It was, it was like a pantomime. It was ridiculous because the actors sounded better than they did. And what happened in Ireland since then? To make a very long story short, that party, the party represented by the man with the gun, is now sharing government in Northern Ireland. They have become a legitimate political party and they are the second biggest party in Northern Ireland. Not exactly what Mrs Thatcher wanted. By banning an organisation, however well-intentioned you are, you can make them far more glamorous, far more attractive to their community. Because they feel like they're being oppressed and they seem more interesting. And it is really quite a fine line between supporting them by mistake and making them stronger rather than the opposite. And Sinn Féin is now not only very strong in Northern Ireland, but becoming very strong in the Republic of Ireland as well. And you could see a future where they will be in government on both, side, both parts of Ireland. It's a long way from a man in a balaclava holding a gun. in my lifetime, in my time working, within 30 years. It's extraordinary how, and no organization is better at message management than Sinn Féin. Everyone wears an Armani suit, nice shirt, nice tie. Everyone has exactly the same answer. You could ask 20 Sinn Féin people a question, you would get the same answer 20 times. Media training. At another level in a whole other world, ISIS and the World Wide Web. <coughs> the terror videos, videos of beheadings, videos of stoning in the street. How to use the media, the World Wide Web, to terrorize and scare and make fearful. The whole world had access to the kind of footage that no media organization would ever carry. <coughs> Terrorism using free web to create fear, to create terror. Always timing attacks to get maximum media coverage. That's every time you hear of an event, a terrorist event, why, think why did they choose that place? Why did they choose this time? What is their agenda? Because they always have an agenda. They think like Lenny Riefenstahl. They think politically. They think like Churchill in the war. They think they're in a conflict and they time their attacks. We noticed in Belfast that bombs mainly happened between 4.30 and 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Why did they mainly happen between 4.30 and 6 o'clock? Six o'clock news. The main news bulletin, six o'clock. The best thing for them was a young reporter saying, there's another explosion in the middle of Belfast. It's a hotel. There are bodies being taken from the premises as we speak. Ambulances are arriving. And that so we had to... We, what did government want us to do? Don't carry it. But then your audience see ambulances in a small town. Imagine this is Tomsk. Same size as Tomsk. So you know if something happened at the other side of town. And you turn on the television and they're not telling you about it. You've lost all faith. No one trusts you anymore. So we carried it, but we stopped the breathless excitement. We had to stop people 
feeling dramatic. I bring you breaking news. Talk with calm respect, because people are dying. Don't talk like it's a sport event. We had a, in my time, main street of a town, a street quite like that, a shop. In front of the shop was a car. It exploded, 18 people were killed. And our journalists wept on air. They cried. Some of their own families were involved. And I had to be very strict and say, no, no. If you weep today and one person dies tomorrow, they're not significant, you don't weep, you don't cry for them. Our job is to be like a surgeon or a doctor, totally professional. Your tears are self-indulgent. No tears. Tell the story. No emotion. Tell the story. You can write about it afterwards. You can make a documentary about it afterwards with lots of emotion. But news has got to be unemotional. They, many of them disagreed with me, I don't think, but that's how it felt to me at the time. Being, news readers being emotional is like an emotional doctor. It's, it's not what you need if you're in trouble. Does anyone disagree with that? Because many of my staff disagreed with me. Big argument. That was a really hard, a little bitter old conflict. Made life very, very difficult. And now, rapidly bounding up to the present, look what the BBC is now facing. It used to be a monopoly, it used to be one, and that is one page of choices. There are 20 other pages like that of channels. Hundreds and hundreds of channels that people can watch. Monopoly all gone. What kind of programs do you think lost most audience with multi-channel television? What programs fell most? I'm sure it's true in Russia as it's true in America as it's true in Britain. Yes, government quite like this because government didn't like there just being two or three big, they were, the BBC in the old days were nearly as strong as government. Government quite like this because their opposition is now divided and they will often go and be interviewed on commercial channels where the interview is incredibly soft, doesn't ask hard questions. So this suits, oh, I'm being accountable to the public. No, you're not. You're speaking on a little breakfast show that you know will never challenge you. So the government quite like this. No, I'm, it's bad news. The programs that have fallen most are the most ambitious programs, arts programs, serious music, documentary, religious programs, dead. 60 to 70% of the audience for factual documentary, gone. People watched them when they didn't have choice, but if you can watch endless game shows, gambling, movies, sport, you don't make a date with programs that are challenging and make you uncomfortable and bring you to different cultures and different identities. It's a sad fact, but the educational purpose of the BBC is in trouble. It's easy to educate people when they're captive and don't have many choices, but if they can choose McDonald's and you're offering them high fiber, many of them go 
sadly, to McDonald's. Middle-class families are different. They program their children. They persuade their children to take watch good programs. But the bulk of people, television is not now part of your education. For your generation, television is old people's entertainment and watched while you're doing other things on your mobile devices. Television is nothing like as powerful as it used to be. The web is now powerful. Radio is not nearly powerful as it was. Newspapers are in serious decline, unless they can find a life online. So you're living through a revolution, a media revolution, as big a revolution as Marconi's, a fundamental change in audience habit and audience belief. Government haven't got a clue how to respond. Government are as confused as we are about how to, but by heavens they're trying to control and manage, but they really don't know. And you are the digital natives. Your generation will create a very different kind of future. A future where Twitter and Amazon, Inst Instagram, rule the, the world. And I intentionally called that slide a new American empire. Because around the world, Donald Trump is bigger than most Hollywood stars. It's frightening. You can get that page. Donald Trump has bypassed all news organizations, called them all fake. And he is now presenting his version of truth by Twitter every night, or usually at five in the morning. No mediation. But look, that, that's where, that's what, those are the rulers of, the, of this universe now. You don't see any BBC title up there. And it's still predominantly American. Just like the movies are predominantly American. And it's a kind of a new American empire. And if I'm the government in Britain or in Russia, I think, this is interesting, maybe scary. Please. You should have worked for the BBC. Because we, we used to say there's a grey curve. As your hair goes grey, you come closer to the BBC. I worked for the BBC for Horizon almost every Yeah, that's, Horizon is one of the great, great documentary series. I made a Horizon once. I felt like I worked in, I was, had just entered Oxford. I was big, big league. But the sad fact, sad fact, the grey curve isn't working. What do you think are the two main genre that rule the World Wide Web? What are the two strongest genre for audiences? This is very depressing. Sport. Sport is about third. Sport. Po well done. Sorry. <laughs> you know too well. <laughs> Porn is first. Gambling is second. Sport is about third. Porn is first. No government is behind the porn industry, but porn is unbelievably strong. No one talks about it. No one, they pretend it isn't there, but it drives the they world. Try they try to control it, but it morphs into a thousand different forms. Gambling is massive. People are gambling now on every game at Wimbledon, every set at Wimbledon, not just the match, but every bit of the match. And there are worldwide consortia running it. And the porn industry is worldwide and no one knows about it. No one is asking questions. 
One thing I should have said to journalists yesterday, and I regret it and I want to say to you, when I ran big newsrooms, and I was once responsible for 7,000 different journalists all over the United Kingdom, we were accused of every possible bias. bias Anti-women, anti-conservative, anti-labor, uh, anti-church. The bias we were never accused of was the one that we were guilty of. Most journalists know nothing about science and technology. Most journalists come from a humanities background. That is really, really bad because back to the media, this industry that we're in was created by brilliant engineers and technologists. So much of the world that we live in is influenced and changed genetic engineering, climate change, multinationals, pharmaceutical industries, all scientists. But our journalists don't ask difficult questions because they don't understand it. They're very good at music, very good at drama, extremely good at politics, because they're obsessed by those things, because nearly all of them come from a humanities background. We need great storytellers who come from a science background. And we need to make difficult quest ask difficult questions in the language of science. And if you come from a science background, you could have a great career, back to Horizon, in the media. And be part of the future. I, I, at no time has the media reunited itself with the people who created it, the technologists. And it's really the technologists who rule this show. And I have no idea, by the way, if those numbers are accurate or true. Because their Instagram numbers, their Twitter numbers, who's checking the validity of these? There's no impartial. We, we accept. And none of us are really qualified to challenge their algorithms. Great opportunity to write articles and to change things. It's such an... I, I, I guess after, God, decades and decades in it, I'd say you've chosen a wonderful world to be in. It's in at no time is it ever dull. At no time is it ever other than fascinating and exciting. And there is no time more fascinating, more exciting than this one. This is like the invention of the motor car. This is the beginning of the internal combustion engine. Horse carriages are in trouble. Old media, newspapers, single radio stations, old-fashioned television will never be the same again. All being changed. But no one knows quite what it will change into, what it will become. But it's your generation that will do it. We've had our turn. And I wish you very, very well doing it. I really do. You'll never regret your choice, I don't think. Now, are there any other questions that I should take from you? Oh, there's a great president. I like that Donald Trump's weapon of choice. He, he, he dismisses his own cabinet now on Twitter. Tillerson did not know he'd been sacked until he read it on Twitter. It's extraordinary. <laughs> Final questions? So I really hope so. That's why I'm here. I really think so. As an Irishman, I come from a very small island. I have always been detached from the big world. It's quite a good place to be. Um, 
I think universities are the conscience of a country. They are the thought process, the heart and soul of a country sometimes. It's where people have a chance to discover themselves and to, through their self-discovery, you are the next generation that will lead your city, your state Siberia, your country Russia. You are the generation that will come into office. You're here to ask hard questions, just like journalists, and to think big thoughts. I don't think any political mood can change that. I, I think we can have very good partnership between my university, Goldsmiths, and Tomsk State. I really do. I think it's begun already. And I trust that we can make it stronger. We can exchange students and bring them. And to see up close and feel what this noise means. And usually for the average person, they feel about as detached from international politics as they do from international football. You support your team. You feel good when your team is winning. You feel bad when your team is losing. But does it fundamentally change your life? I think. What can you do, the question you're about to ask, what can we do about international diplomacy? Join the diplomatic service. Because there are thousands of very bright young people whose job it is to meet those challenges on the British side, the Russian side, the American side. Um, it's a very complex life and you end up often communicating a very different thing in January to the thing you were communicating in November. That governments move, 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 move. But I think universities research is about finding and communicating knowledge. That's far more exciting than noise. I think. And if we can discover and communicate together, it will be even stronger. Because very little, all research now is collaborative, not one institution. And I hope we can find ways of I really do. I think we will.